In a world gone mad, this is loving, caring, sharing. It's Friday night, guys, so you know what that means. It's Mark Mercer's Loving, Caring, and Sharing. Coming to you live from the city of Brotherly Shove. It's me, yours truly. And uh, we've been looking forward to this night for a while. This has been a a long time coming. Actually, I wanted to do this interview years ago, but I wasn't famous then. I'm still not famous, but I'm somebody. I'm just not that much of a somebody. But needless to say, uh, this interview has been coming for quite a while, and I've just been looking forward to it for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um... First of all, I just want to uh, thank Daniel Davison, my producer, for uh, setting tonight's show up. Kind of pulled it all together with a little bit of bailing twine, some duct tape. Way to go, mate. Appreciate that. And, uh, Daniel, are you still with us tonight? Oh, of course I am. Oh, that's the spirit. Okay. And, of course, joining us at Loving Caring Studios West in uh, Springdale, Arkansas, is uh, my co-host, my master of arms, Steve Deloach. Yeah, how are you doing, Stephen? I'm doing good, but I'm not in Springdale, Arkansas tonight. Oh, oh that's right. You're in Tulsa, aren't you? I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, high atop the Hilton Hotel Southern Hills here in Tulsa, overlooking the beautiful ORU campus. And you've got some company in your studio, don't you? Yes, I do. I have a good friend of mine here with me tonight. He doesn't have a mic. He's listening in. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name is Buddy Barwick. He's a Now, where doctor. do I know that name from? Well, we're going to be interviewing his daughter soon. His daughter is Juliana Barwick, right. uh, a very talented artist, and we're going to be interviewing her soon. And uh, I remember when Juliana was born, so Buddy and I have been friends for a long, long time. He's a very long-suffering soul. Wow, well, that's great. Buddy, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on board. And, of course, joining us from down Mississippi Way is uh, our buddy uh, Don Hartness. Don, how are you doing tonight? I've unmuted I'm, you. I'm here. That's my boy. All right. Well, fasten your seatbelt because you guys are in for a ride. Um, I've known this guy for um, a while. I think this goes back to 1994. In 1994, I was working in Pete LaCroix's basement, helping him turn his basement into a cabin getaway in the Poconos, but it was in northeast Philadelphia. And uh, he came down the steps one day with a bottle of uh, ginger ale. But not just ginger ale, a brewed ginger ale. And he said, you got to try this. you got to try this. You're not going to believe this. you got to try this. And, uh, of course, I was thirsty and uh, ready for something to drink. And I slugged it down, and I said, I have to have this for the rest of my life. Where would you get this? And he said, I got it from this co-op. And then we started going and buying the stuff at this co-op. And then we found out they were ripping us off. We started buying it from this place called BK Distributors down southwest Philadelphia. So we bought it from them for quite a while, got a lot of it. Just go down there, buy 10 cases at a time, and just drinking it and enjoying it. And then one day uh, we're down there, and uh, one of the BK guys, uh, Brett, said to me, hey, you know, you do. Uh, you love coming down here all the time. Uh, you know, the fancy food show's coming to Philadelphia. How would you like free tickets to walk around and eat food all day? And I said, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, sure. Just hook me up. So the next thing I know... Uh, he calls me up like two days later, and he says, hey, i got a better idea. Chris Reed is coming to the show. He's going to run a booth. How would you, like sh- you like to run the booth with him and meet him? Because you're, you know more about this product than anybody in Philadelphia. And I said, are you kidding? He says, yeah, we'll pay. I said, <laughs> yeah, okay. So I got to meet Chris Reed, and uh, we became instant friends. And uh, you know, we were you know, doing the food show and stuff, but um, – we had a lot of camaraderie and stuff, and over the years, uh, I've sold uh, Reed's Ginger Brew for Chris, and um, we've become very good friends. Now, we drifted apart for a couple of years, and his companies continue to grow and move on, and uh, just a while ago, I actually touched base with Chris again, and I said, hey, you know, I would love to have you on Loving, Caring, and Sharing. He says, what in the world are you talking about? And I said, I, I, I'm doing this internet radio show on uh, North Star Radio, and I, I would love to do an interview with you, and he's like, uh, okay. And, uh, actually the first phone call went something like this. Chris Reed. Hey, Chris, it's Mark from Philadelphia. Click. And then there was a second phone call. No, 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 it's me. Remember? And so he remembered. And so we were talking and I said, you know, what I want to do, Chris, is I'd like to do like a, an in-depth interview with you. And he said, uh, how long? I said, two hours. He goes, what? I said, yeah, two hours. And he said, all right. And so, uh, anyway, after, uh, Oh, just it's been. It seems like it's been a long time coming. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, now on uh, by way of Skype at Loving, Caring, and Sharing is my uh, old buddy Chris Reed. How are you doing, Chris? Great. How are you doing, Mark? 
I'm doing fantastic. I want to thank you for taking time out of your uh, Friday evening to spend time with us. I know you're on West Coast time, and it's early in the evening, and this is a little odd for you doing something like this, but I really appreciate it. Uh, no problem. It's my fun. Okay. So, Chris, uh, what I want to do is I want to go back. We're going to talk about, you know, about how you came into what you do these days. But, you know, like I explained earlier, um, what I like to do is I like to give people a full picture of a human being, not just the snapshot, not just the 15 minutes on Oprah, not just the, you know, uh, the, the news blurb. I like going back and, and getting, giving everybody the full picture of who this person is. And I want to go way back to uh, your early beginnings. Now, you were a poor black child from Mississippi, am I right? That's right. You know, you say that, and uh, it turns out there's a scandal in our family. And I knew uh, it. my dad's dad doesn't know his dad. And we think that uh, because we went to National Geographic and they did a little swab for your DNA. Uh huh. We were wondering why we had so much uh, African American in us, Tunisian uh, DNA. Tunisian? We, we figured everybody came out of Africa, but they explained to us, no, this is actually recent. So uh, then we kind of queried and went through the ancestral thing. It turns out, you know, I'm probably some little, probably maybe from Mississippi. Uh, is that right? Okay. But you're, also, you're also part Amish, so this is really weird. Right? <laughs> I'm a mutt. I'm okay. an Irish mutt. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, where did you, you grow up? Where did you grow up? I, I forget. Lancaster? No, actually, my old man was a military guy, so I, you know, I've been everywhere. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. All right. So, so uh, tell us about the beginning. Where, where were you? Where were you born? Where did you start growing up? I was born in Queens, New York City. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, no memory of it. Um, my dad taught at West Point, the military academy, and uh, I know it was there in the early years. But you know, we were in Kentucky, you know, Pennsylvania. One mm-hmm. tour towards that was high school though. Mm-hmm. Early, uh, he went to Vietnam. I was in uh, Tucson for the year, staying w- uh, closer to his folks uh-huh. uh, who had retired to Tucson. Um, right. But Fort Hood, uh, be- in between that, you know, probably seven or eight. Fort Hood, uh, Texas, that is, outside of Dallas, I believe. Um, so you grew up like yeah. uh, like a lot of military kids, where you, you didn't really have like more than a year or so, a couple of years maybe at any one school, huh? Twelve twelve years of school, twelve different places. Is that right? Almost every yeah. year. Well, in one place I stayed two years, and one place I stayed a half year. Two places really? I stayed a half year. Yeah. So what, when you were when you were growing up, like, did you have like aspirations, like I want to be a baseball player or any of that kind of stuff? Uh, I knew I wanted to be rich. Oh. <laughs> she did that right away. Wow. Well, I think so. As a kid, I was kept like going, "How am I going to figure out how to squeeze money out of this world?" You know. Right. And yeah. I, so I, I was crazy. You know. Um, but I look back, I, I had a lot of discipline. I will tell you how weird it was. You're on my favorite subject. But anyway, um, I would go out trick or treating, and I would get a bag full of candy, and I had a ammo box from the old man, and I had a lock on it. And I would eat one candy a day because I knew that I had 365 candies and it would last me till the next Halloween. Um, but I would, you know, kind of find ways to make money. When I was young, I used to wash cars. I was in, living in Germany in the military uh, stationed, uh, not me personally, an old man stationed in, in uh, uh, Frankfurt, Nuremberg. And I'd go out in the wintertime and wash cars, you know, in 70, early 70s. Making so you, were a little, you were like a little capitalist even as yeah. a teen. I was making ten bucks an hour, you know, no taxes uh, in '70 as a 13-year-old. Nice. Yeah, and you know, I, I had electric guitar. I didn't spend a lot of money, but I had a, some cool stuff. And uh, that's right. You started getting into music kind of young, didn't you? Right. I, okay, okay. Aspiration. I definitely still play guitar. Still uh-huh. like I perform a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a lot of recording stuff, and uh, uh, I did come out to L.A. Uh, after I quit chemical engineering and spent a year studying music at the Musicians Institute. So I I still have aspirations. And now that we're a big company and we sponsor events, I actually uh, asked to play with the bands. And, uh, <laughs> you starting, can get away with that, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm giving you money, man. I want a little time on the stage. Yeah, <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah. So wait, so, so you started getting into the guitar. When was that? How old were you? 
12, 13. Now, you and I are the same age, right? You're going to be, I think you're like six months older than me. You're like, uh, you're going to be 54 this year? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I thought so. You graduated in 76. Right. From high school. Okay, I thought so. Yeah, I remember. All right, very good. So, so you and I grew up listening to pretty much, you know, what, what did you listen to? What, well, what, 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 I, what you listened to uh, was Frank Zappa. That's right. You got it. <laughs> and I caught a little Zappa because every once in a while you'd find a friend, you'd be hanging out, and they'd put on their Zappa. So I wasn't a Zappa, you know, freak. I'm surprised like, you remember that. Me and Pete used to torture you with that, didn't we? I loved it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. I thought, you know, at the time when I met you, you know, 20 years later after the, the late 60s, early 70s, I figured, okay, there's no way I will ever indulge in Frank Zappa again. And here I am running into this time warp, you guys. Right. And I was like, good Lord, they're listening to Zappa. And, you know, as a kid, you listen to Zappa. But when, 20 years later, when you listen to Zappa, it's a whole other thing. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're we, like, he we never broke. sucks. But, no, I mean, he's still, he's a very interesting character. And I, I have more appreciation for him. Mm-hmm. I'm glad partially to hear. due to you. That's good to hear. I'm sure Frank would yeah. like to hear that. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure Frank would love to be here hearing anything. All right. So, so, you, what, so what were you listening to, though, when you were growing up? I mean, you know, what, were your, what was the stuff that made you say you wanted to pick up the guitar? Um, well, Aerosmith, you know, Led Zeppelin. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's get uh, clear on this. Uh, Carlos Santana. Oh, yeah. And uh, definitely uh, Jimi Hendrix. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't listening so much to the Stones. I actually didn't listen to the Beatles that much. I mean, yeah. I, originally I grew up with Motown. Oh, so did I. Yeah, because I living on a military base... Uh, very uh, integrated right. uh, before the world was, you know, many decades before the world was. I right. remember my neighbor was uh, Victor White. He was a black guy, and he was my best buddy. Uh-huh. You know, I'd, anyway, I got in a lot of trouble in D.C. with him later on. That was high school. But uh, to uh, just everybody was listening to Motown. Mm-hmm. So I, the Supremes, the Temptations. I still can't believe the Temptations don't have, like, a reunion tour. Cause, uh, yeah, you would I think. Thought, yeah, they're just unbelievable songs, man. Yeah, incredible stuff. Yeah. So, but, you know, from a guitar standpoint, you know, Jeff Beck and also in there and, you know, all these great guitarist monsters. I probably listen to Jeff Beck's Blow by Blow more than any album on earth, just about. I, I, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure this is the number one album I've listened to the most. Hmm. But it's just, it really impressed me. I mean, it's just completely, I mean, incredible plan, just yeah. fun stuff. And I love the bass guitar guy on on uh, Blow by Blow. A lot of people right. never never heard of the guy, but uh, he was fantastic. No, I can't remember his name. Well, I mean, I think Aer- Aerosmith, Toys in the Attic. You know, that that was probably more at the time when I was playing more guitar, learning mm-hmm. stuff. Believe it or not, we were listening to a lot of David Bowie back then. Oh yeah, Bowie. Now, mm-hmm. what was your first guitar? Do you remember? Uh, a Gibson SG. Your first was a I hate you. you. Your first guitar was a Gibson XG. Cheese and crackers. Well, oh. when did you get that? You know, it kind of sucked. I think they had come up with a, a version of the SG that really wasn't an SG. It was like an inexpensive, cheap version of an SG that okay. just did not hold being in tune at all. <laughs> you know, And later on, I played like a real SG. I said, yeah, this is actually a great guitar. But that one sucked. It really didn't have it. But I've always been a Gibson guy. I'm a humbucker, not a single... Right. Uh, foils kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So how old were you? Oh, I, I think I got my first guitar around 12, 13. That's when I got mine. Okay. Yeah. I'm getting kind of SG, though. So uh, so what did you do? Did you, start, uh, did you take lessons or you just start jamming with people or what? Uh, my parents, uh, we had six kids and a military guy. He was actually pretty uh, conservative. You have five siblings? Yeah, five yeah. siblings. So they... They didn't spend a lot of money on us, you know. It's kind of like, right. ah, okay, you play the guitar, go play guitar. You know, it's too bad because I would practice every day, an hour a day. And, uh, you know, I really didn't have the Internet. Definitely the Internet would have just been a, an end, end of the game for me because I was so committed. It would have been great. I'd have never, uh, else I guarantee you that. I'd have, never, I'd have never played ice hockey or soccer if they had the Internet when we were kids. Yeah. Really? I'd have never left the house. No, I, I know. I watch my kids. It's really hard to see them. They're all consumers of content. They don't create any content. I'm like, oh my god, you know, let's all write some music. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Yeah, but I, actually, 
right now I've got um, I have the house set up. My kid plays 